So uh, hello everyone, thank you for, for uh, coming along. Uh, last time, uh, a month ago, seems a long time ago, I don't know about anybody else, the sort of term started in between the last seminar and this one, so that's, that seems ages ago. Um, well, the weather's very nice now anyway, isn't it? Anyway, sorry, I'm mambling. Um, welcome to the kind of the uh, the, the next next of these seminars. Uh, the, the kind of the the sequence of the of the series has, has moved from kind of some general uh, background about mass observation, then uh, some discussions about the use of mass observation material specifically in relation to COVID. So the, the, the focus of this um, session is really to move away from mass observation materials to other diary based life life um, writing based research projects which have been looking at COVID as well. So we have um, three papers um, looking at different uh, uh, projects of, of similar sorts to, to the mass observation projects as well. Um, uh, what we're going to do is just go we'll move move through in, in in sequence. I think as before, if people have particular questions um, as papers go along, then you can kind of uh, wave as it were in the chat and we might um, um, uh, stop and slow down for some immediate questions after each paper, uh, but then also kind of come back at the end of uh, all three and have some um, uh, more general discussion if that if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'll just throw uh, things over to, to the speakers as we go along and um, people can load up their slides and uh, um, and go from there. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Claire Cowie uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Claire, I'll leave it to you to introduce both your project and um, large numbers of colleagues, I think, technically. Thanks, Clive. Um, I'll just share my screen here. There we go. Um, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, thanks very much for having us today. Uh, we've really appreciated the MO series since we're working with diaries and it's um, really been helpful to think through so many of the um, things that come up when you're working with that particular medium. So um, as you can see, there are a lot of us who worked on this particular um, presentation today where we're gonna be looking at um, the way that place is represented um, in our diaries. Um, but we do also have like a much bigger team at the University of Edinburgh. So um, uh, the, it's, it's, it's made up of researchers from all over the university and headed up by Lauren Hall Liu, um, my colleague in linguistics and English language. And these are all the people who's, who've been involved and you can see that they involve data scientists and health scientists and political analysts and um, Lauren and myself and um, my colleagues today are social linguists. And there we are. And um, so the, the, the Lothian Diary Corpus is, is, is audio and video self-recordings from residents of Edinburgh and the Lothians and the surrounding area. And we collected the data over 2020 and 21 and in kind of three stages, which I'll talk about. And um, as I said, these are self-recorded um, audio and video diaries. I think the original idea was video only, and then we expanded that to audio. And respondents were paid for, for uploading their diaries and they could donate that payment um, to one of our charity partners as well. And um, we recruited um, uh, contributors through radio adverts, social media, school lists of flyers, um, and eventually through our charity partners. And of course, when we started recruiting, it was lockdown. And um, so we had to um, find different ways of, of recruiting our participants, participants to what we normally would. Um, and then these um, recordings are automatically transcribed and then they have to be corrected. And if we want to do speech analysis, then, then there's a kind of further process involved. And um, so the, the, we have these three stages. Um, there was the first call that we put out um, in, in the first lockdown. And um, we found that quite a lot of participants who were responding to that were people People who had the, the space to make recordings and the equipment and the expertise to make recordings. So of course that did skew the, the contributors that we got. Um, and we realized that we were not including people who maybe had been most affected by the pandemic. Um, and so we um, 
were partnered with charities in the second stage who were working with people who'd been made homeless or um, had disabilities and were, were affected in the pandemic. So um, we, we included more contributions um, that way. And then we had a third stage where we got additional funding to work with children and carers. And so we have like a, another section of those and that just gives you some idea of how we have about almost 200 contributions altogether, but it is um, somewhat unbalanced um, um, for these reasons. Um, and um, the only restriction was that uh, we have residents from Edinburgh and the Lothians and um, I mean, there's no other restriction. There wasn't a restriction on language or, or anything else. And this is just gives you some idea of the population we're working with, probably pretty small for people um, who've been working down south. So just half a million in Edinburgh itself and then um, uh, going up uh, to a million, including those um, Lothians areas. And uh, this is what we've ended up with. Um, uh, more women and um, we actually have a better representation of people of colour than Edinburgh's population, uh, also more migrants than Edinburgh's overall population and more LGBTQ. Um, we probably have an accurate representation of speakers with a disability and then we have an over-representation as I suggested of people with a post-secondary education. And uh, uh, as I said, um, um, those of us who are speaking to you today are social linguists um, and we've already done and, and used the diaries um, for some projects um, looking at changes in speech in Edinburgh over time because we have earlier archives of speech. Um, and then actually some of the diaries have been incorporated into an oral history archive which is being hosted by Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. Um, we're developing them as an educational resource to be used in science festivals. And um, we've had held a few cultural events around the diaries and um, they're about to be um, uh, included in a meeting in Scottish Parliament to draw attention um, to um, how people have been, in the area have been affected by the pandemic. Um, so just to give you some idea of what speakers are imagining when they're actually recording, um, they're, uh, they're recording it for us, a group of researchers, um, but there's a lot of emphasis on how this is going to be incorporated into an oral history um, of the pandemic. And, and um, so this audience is obviously going to um, affect contributions, although speakers could choose if they wanted to be included in the oral history or not. Um, and we had a series of prompts. We told um, speakers that they could um, just talk about lockdown experiences, um, but we did have a series of prompts like how to life change during lockdown, what is a typical day before and after, what's the hardest part, any new skills or hobbies, how is working from home, um, and actually um, we didn't really intend for people to stick to these very closely, but quite a lot of people did um, use that format. And uh, um, as social linguists, we're, we're very interested in self-recordings as a genre, as a means of data collection. Um, they tend to be very stylistically different, so they are appealing um, in some ways because they can be much more vernacular or informal than, um, for, than interviews, um, which is traditionally used in social linguistics. Um, but uh, we think that some self-recordings and, and we think these ones that we've made um, are actually more formal. Um, others, there's are social linguistic studies which just have uh, speakers with a lapel mic attached to them as they go about, you know, being a taxi driver or whatever it happens to be. And those tend to be really informal, but, but the ones we have are, are quite different. Um, we also thought they might end up being like some crisis narratives so that there's quite a few studies in social linguistics which um, make use of crisis narratives. For example, this one I've cited is from the earthquake in I think around 2015 in New Zealand and where they had a quake box and they collected accounts where people could go and talk about their experience of the quake. Um, again, we think that what we're dealing with it is a bit different in that. They're not sort of organized as a single event in that way. 
Um, we also thought we might be collecting um, recordings which are a lot like YouTube videos, um, because just at the start of lockdown, we started to notice the YouTube videos and we imagined that we would be capturing um, something quite similar. Um, but I think, although we do see some um, of those conventions um, stylistically, I think they're also quite different um, to those. So, and as I said, um, speakers tend to stick to the questions. Um, what's also very interesting um, is that we can definitely see that for some people, this is a creative outlet, that they um, would like their contribution to be poetic in some way. And I know that people have spoken about this in the, in the, in the mass observation diaries. So, so that's very interesting. It's something that we're definitely aware of as well. Um, so uh, today we want to look at place. And um, as I said, um, the only restriction on these contributions was that you had to be a resident of Edinburgh and Lothians. And um, um, so we think that contributors must be identifying themselves in, in some way um, as, as connected to Edinburgh. And um, we're interested um, in people's relationships to their immediate neighborhood and to the idea of the city and maybe the surrounds of the city and where they think the boundaries of the city are. And we're also interested in how that changes over time, because as I suggested, we have these earlier archives of Edinburgh speech where people talk a lot about their neighborhood. And there is this history of um, what were formerly considered vill villages in Edinburgh, like Leith, which um, have become incorporated in the city over time. And um, we wanted to see how, how that kind of development um, played out in these recordings. Um, and we think that um, so lockdown and the pandemic is a kind of juncture where, where speakers are going to comment on their, um, their, um, uh, uh, their regional identity or their city identity. And we also think moving online is, is, is also going to get them to comment on, on, the, on where place fits into their identity. Um, so in terms of our methods for tackling the diaries, we have kind of two strands. We've, we're trying to tackle them in a quantitative way, um, also because we've got data scientists on our team, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how that's working. And then um, the team that um, um, is involved today, we've been all um, trying to code up the, the transcripts using um, grounded theory. And so um, we're very great going to try and look at the codes which are kind of emerging um, from the data and that's going to be quite a, a long process. Um, so we've coded just a sample so far of only about 29 speakers and those um, we decided to tackle people who are living alone first, um, partly because we think we, we might be more affected by these issues um, and also um, the other speakers are not going to be a big part of the recording, they're just mainly going to be talking about themselves. Um, and we're going to be drawing on the notion of the chronotope um, to talk about um, place in the diaries. Um, of course, we're interested in um, stylistic presentation, both in terms of the speech and the video styling, but we won't be talking too much about the, the video styling today. Um, so, um, the notion of the chronotope that we're interested in is, is one with an emphasis on, on representation. So um, uh, I think the chronotope in literature um, has really looked at time and space and characters in literature. Um, and so there is an emphasis on, on representation. Um, in sociology, there seems to be more of an interest in, in social types um, with, with less um, emphasis on their representation of those social types. Um, but uh, more recently in, in linguistic anthropology, which is a bit closer to, to the way that we're working, is that there is this um, emphasis on the way that um, speakers represent chronotypes. Um, and um, we were very um, influenced by Erica Britt's um, study of um, the representations of Flint, Michigan, um, because she's looking at chronotopic representations of place which is something that we want to do. And she's looking at the way that um, um, Split Michigan is represented in, in certain discourses. Um, 
and um, and uh, she also looks at the way that um, residents of Flint in oral history interviews actually counteract those chronotopic representations of Flint with their own chronotopic representations. And she looks at the discursive tools that they use to do that. For example, the way that they characterize outsider speech about Flint and the way that they kind of satirize that. Okay, um, so, um, Chronotopes in the Lothian Diaries, then um, we're interested in, in how um, speakers reference neighborhoods, the city, um, suburbs, the Lothians area. Um, we're also looking out for the naming of, of locations. And um, in terms of time, um, we've asked people explicitly to compare pre-pandemic and, and, and in the pandemic but also we've got these shifts in and out of lockdown, which come up as well. And then, um, and I think that many people have been interested in this, how people talk about the future as well. Um, I think we've, our analysis of social types is, is less developed, um, but you'll see that later. Um, just to give you a very quick idea of how the quantitative data may kind of give us a bit of a background. Um, the Edinburgh Geoparser, which is a tool developed um, by our colleague uh, Beatrice Alex, um, uh, looks at all the mentions of place in a large data set. So our data set is actually quite small for the Edinburgh Geoparse. It's actually used to processing very large data sets and finding mentions of place. And um, anyway, so we put the, 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 the diaries that um, we have into the Geoparser. And what it found was that actually, um, uh, mostly people were talking about places outside the UK, that's by far mentioned um, the most. And um, we were actually looking for people to talk about how they felt about Edinburgh and their local neighbourhoods. So um, we're going to have to kind of really get to the bottom of, of why people are mostly talking about um, um, other places. So it's not just cancelled holidays and um, it, it is it obviously much more than that. And um, it is their relationship with people um, in other countries. Um, that's just a visual representation. And um, we actually thought it might make a difference um, about how people frame themselves when they, because they usually start with a little introduction. Sometimes they'll say their name, but they'll say something about themselves. And we thought it might make a difference if people said, um, I'm from Stockbridge in Edinburgh, rather than just from, I'm in Edinburgh. Um, but actually that doesn't really make a difference to the chronotype. Um, what does seem to make a difference is where they actually are rather than how they're describing it. Um, so getting onto the chronotopes themselves then, so I need to hurry up. Um, and um, I've got five that I'm gonna briefly run through. And um, uh, what we've got is, uh, first one is um, participants reflecting on um, how ed exciting Edinburgh was for them um, pre-pandemic and how it provided lots of opportunities, particularly the city. And they don't seem to talk about a replacement for that in any way. It's, it's, it's presented as a loss. And these are often uh, male speakers. And um, so you can see in this first example, this male speaker is actually talking about pubs in his area and pubs and live music in his area, naming places in his area. And um, so these kind of specific locations um, are, are lost for him. Um, and here's someone who um, is actually not talking about um, locations uh, in her um, and his immediate neighborhood, but um, uh, locations a bit closer into the city, but that's um, also kind of something that's been very central to that person and, and have been lost in the pandemic. And the second chronotype is um, where you have um, uh, activity which is strongly linked to a location and that activity has been able to quite successfully move online. So in this example from this older speaker here, um, he's retired to a village called Haddington in East Lothian and he's very clear about how he um, uh, explicitly retired to um, East Lothian with the aim of building up community there. And, um, and so one of the things he did in East Lothian was join a church in East Lothian and um, so uh, he was initially worried um, that he wouldn't have that, but then that seems to quite successfully for him move online. 
Um, and then there are other speakers who um, um, also have activities um, that move online quite successfully, um, but maybe not so closely linked to their neighborhood. So this is a speaker who um, also an older retired person um, and she, uh, one of the many things that she did was the theater. And then she talks about how um, she transitioned to watching theater online with her friends. And the speaker is also doing yoga and counseling and book group um, on Zoom. And um, these all tend to be kind of better results speakers who are making this um, successful transition. And um, then um, for one of our speakers, and I stress that this is just one because we don't actually have that many people from um, towns in the Lothians, but we were quite struck by this one. Uh, the speaker is talking about um, um, really how the local community um, in this small town, which she doesn't actually name, is pulling together. And she was worried that that wouldn't actually happen, but she says our wee community can, can rally together and, uh, and that is sustaining her. And then um, the fourth one is um, the idea um, of Edinburgh um, suddenly becoming accessible to um, speakers who actually maybe did not have, felt, did not feel that they had access to the city before or who were kind of shut out or alienated in some way. And we had quite a lot of people um, who um, presented with this kind of prototype and a lot of them were international students and some of them were migrants. And um, they usually talked about getting access to the city by foot or by bike. Um, and so lots of um, uh, comments from, from this group saying, um, I can walk um, on the street now, um, that's my timer. But um, um, they also say things about, um, I, I have more access to the city now, it, it, it feels more like my city. And they're contrasting it with how they felt as an international student where they, they didn't really feel like they had that access to the city. Um, and the last speaker here says, this, I feel like this place is also mine. And uh, here's a slightly different speaker who um, actually um, was um, someone who needed a lot of support from charities in the pandemic. And one of the means of support was uh, a, a donation of a bicycle. And um, this enabled um, this speaker to actually go and fetch meals um, from, from charities because she wasn't living in a place with a kitchen. And um, so the bicycle was um, very useful to her, but it also has this effect of giving her access to the city. And she talks about riding the bicycle around the city, even when she doesn't actually uh, need it to get food. Uh, and the last one um, is we have um, speakers who are making use of um, groups which are supported by volunteers and charities in specific venues, um, which were shut down in the pandemic and they um, strongly feel the loss of those and they usually kind of name the location that's involved and it, it's not really about the neighborhood but it's really about that group and that venue and those speakers unfortunately have um, really um, lost access to that and they, there isn't actually a, a replacement for them uh, and they talk about um, that as a loss so um, these are our um, uh, five chronotopes that we've identified so far, I think we can sort of detect them um, in the sample um, uh, quite readily. And um, we are looking forward to, to maybe seeing if we can um, see them in a bigger sample. So I'll leave you with this quote from the last speaker about the, um, the whole world being thrown into isolation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Claire. That's kind of really um, <clears throat> fascinating. I have to say, it's very geographical from uh, from from our perspective. That's that's nice because uh, uh, we have not got a lot of that. Um, I wonder if anybody has any particular uh, well, there's ooh, lots of hands suddenly going up. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very bad at actually looking at um, hands. Uh, Anastasia, I think you have your hand up. I can see. Would you like to? Sorry, I was just clapping. I thought that was really fascinating. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, thank you very much. That was really great. Great. Okay. Well, I look forward to talking to you later. Sorry. Right. Likewise. Yeah. They weren't hands up. They were clappings. Okay. Lots of applause. Um, if anybody does have an immediate question or comment, then then 
wave desperately or butt in um, or say different names. Now that is a hand, I'm sure. Um, uh, Victoria. Hi, thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask about um, in relation to um, the chronotype and pulling through the language um, that that uh, supports that? Can you talk a little bit more about that and what you what you how you identify and what you do with that language? Yeah, um, I think that um, we're still trying to. Um, develop our methods. I mean, we, we started off with um, um, coding um, all I mean, our sample of transcripts and just coding them in a very um, open way. Um, so um, uh, one of our authors, Steve McNulty, has is, is coached us all in, in, in taking a grounded theory approach where we're, where we're very open about what we're coding. So we might um, say um, the speaker is um, um, talking about missing family or um, the speaker is um, uh, not able to leave the house or, you know, whenever people um, uh, talk about um, uh, an activity um, or a feeling, um, then we, we would sort of try and code it in that way. And then we also coded for people talking about um, um, places, we coded for people talking about um, the neighborhoods. And um, so we've, we've all got these lots and lots of these um, codes that we've put into Envivo and then we're, we've um, sat down and looked at each other's code books. Um, and um, so we're trying to kind of find these, these common threads. And I guess at the moment, um, um, what we're looking for is um, threads which um, are in, involving time and space. And, um, and then we look at who might um, be talking about time and space in the same way. Um, so that's been our, our process so far. Um, I'm not sure we would stick with the chronotype. <laughs> um, it just seemed like a, a, a useful way of, of, of guessing at place. Um, for the moment, but I think we're quite committed to um, our grounded theory and um, and so it might be that actually, um, like the numbers suggest, people are mostly talking about not being able to talk to someone or see someone in another country or travel, and so that might end up being more dominant. So I think we just do have to be a bit careful about letting the chronotypes um, uh, in, impose themselves on the data too much. I hope that answers the question. There's, there's a question on the chat, Claire, about um, how exactly um, you engage with the geo parser. Yeah, um, so all we've done with the geo parser so far is just um, get a sense of how much people are talking about. Um, Edinburgh in comparison to how much they're talking about their local neighborhood in comparison to you know Scotland and further afield and um, um, we were um, quite surprised by the output of the geoparser um, you know we were looking forward to people saying oh I'm so happy I'm in Portobello or I'm so happy I'm in Leith or, or the opposite and they're, they're not talking about their neighborhoods that much so the geoparser hasn't um, well, it's, it's told us that we're not getting what we expected. So we still have a lot of work to, to do in that area. And as I suggested, we thought it was going to matter if people said, I'm from Stockbridge in Edinburgh, but it didn't sort of seem to matter how they introduced themselves. It, it was more about where they were actually um, doing the recording from. Okay, thank you. Thanks so, so much. Um, uh, the big chance to pick up um, uh, other themes and, and questions from, from Claire's talk later. That was really kind of a, a fascinating start. We're going to move on to the, the next talk, which is uh, Victoria Bowman from the Young Foundation. And uh, I can't, I think. Hi. Oh, oh. 
Brilliant. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it to you to, to set, set yourself up and introduce your project, Victoria. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to try and do the screen sharing magic, of course, which uh, doesn't seem to be giving me quite what I want. Um, too many windows open, too many tabs. People always laugh when they see my desktop. Right, there we go. Let's try that one. Um, so, um, Hopefully you can all see that. Is that good? Brilliant. Great. So thank you for inviting me along. And um, yeah, really great to hear the presentation from Claire there. Um, apart from things, I'm extremely jealous of your huge team. Um, and so uh, I'm here on behalf of the Young Foundation team, which was uh, distinctly smaller. There were really about four of us working on this project part time. Um, just before I kind of go any further, just to introduce uh, the Young Foundation, I'm assuming I'm speaking to a large number of sociologists and most of you are probably familiar with Michael Young and probably somewhere way back in your undergrad days read Family and Kinship in East London. Um, and we are the legacy institution of Michael Young, which was originally the Institute for Community Studies. Um, and kind of, yeah, we've got this, this long history uh, started by Michael. Um, and today we are still based in Bethel Green um, and up until earlier this year we were actually still in his house um, and we do three things today we kind of do research we do community development and kind of community capacity building and we still support and enable innovation for social good so um, the main thrust though is our mission today is about enabling communities to thrive and to flourish and to create stronger stronger places and so this project came about um, obviously right at the start of the pandemic thinking about well what's this going to do to our relationships and how we experience community life. Um, there were three main research questions that underpinned our work at the big project it was really talking about relationships between individuals, how digital kind of interacts with that and shapes and affects community life and also about how individuals and communities um, both kind of interact with each other and trust in science and research. Um, this project actually built off of an earlier project that we started right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, where we had two pieces of work which we tried to get underway as quickly as we possibly could, like everybody else. Um, and so we had 600, almost 600 adults complete um, a citizen science project with the OU. And we also had around 80 people keeping um, some form of online diary. Um, but I think like Claire mentioned was hers, we had the same issue that wasn't very representative of the UK population. We had a, a, an over preponderance of women, of people who are from a kind of more better kind of socioeconomic uh, backgrounds um, and sort of underrepresenting um, minority groups. Um, the other challenge we had was that as a small charity, we don't have any kind of core funding. So just kind of maintaining this alongside our, our normal work was difficult. Um, and so at that point, uh, we kind of were expanding our work on COVID more broadly as well. Um, so this work actually sits at the heart of its biggest piece of a big portfolio of research that we've been doing about communities um, during COVID. And don't ask me how we're going to tie it all together at the end. I haven't even got that far yet. That's, that's a big challenge for 2022. Um, but we were very lucky at this point to secure a welcome trust engagement grant, um, which meant that from August we could really ramp up the project and make it much more representative. Um, so it enabled us to really diversify our sample. So we had around 140 diary keepers in the end. Um, some of those were volunteers from the original study, um, but we actually went out and purposefully recruited um, a more diverse group and we actually oversampled and overrepresented um, some of those most affected. So we had sort of around a quarter of our sample is from a minority ethnic background. And we also kind of overrepresented people who have pre existing health conditions, key workers, groups like that. Um, and we also overrepresented the devolved nations because obviously the experiences in each nation were were a bit different and the rules and things were changing at different times. Alongside this, we adopted a peer research approach. So we had um, nine peer researchers who were carrying out telephone interviews with 15 people who were digitally excluded for a wide range of reasons, whether that was kind of 
uh, digital literacy or language or all of those kinds of reasons. And that broadly mirrored, though in a lighter touch way, what was happening with the online diaries. And then we wrapped it all up at the end of last year with a large national survey. Um, so we explored four themes. I'm not kind of going to go through uh, all of these in detail. I think the key thing to say is that for us, one of the big advantages of this methodology was that whilst we kind of defined our themes in advance in relation to the objectives, it meant that we were able to kind of decide the exact questions and the exact prompts that we were putting out to people on essentially a weekly basis so we could respond to new lockdowns, we could respond to discovery of vaccines and all things like that. So it was a, a very dynamic uh, project for us. Um, and what I'm gonna talk through now is, I'm gonna actually focus quite a lot on the methodology um, that we used and talk through some of what we've experienced as the advantages and disadvantages of that. But I'm gonna use the kind of the trust um, theme as the kind of the illustrative one of that to kind of show how we, we worked through this process and some of the types of insights that we were able to, to gather in this way. Um, so the diaries were collected through a dedicated online platform, and this is a specialist qualitative research platform that um, it looks and feels a lot like a social media platform. So it's a private social media platform, very intuitive for people to take part in. Um, they see a little grid of their tasks in different weeks, what's outstanding, what they need to be doing. Um, most of those are private, but there's also um, kind of shared discussion bulletin board type space as well. We want them to interact with each other. Um, and then, so for example, on the bottom right there, that rather stern looking picture of Boris was um, the very first task we gave people was to watch a composite video that we mocked up of all the four national leaders announcing that very first lockdown. And we made people relive that horrible moment and reflect on what they felt at that point in time and how they responded and who they kind of spoke to and kind of really just immerse them back uh, into it. Um, so we were looking at three things across trust. We were primarily focusing on trust in government, trust in science and trust in people's communities. Um, but it's important to say that actually media came out so strongly that that kind of became uh, a fourth dimension of this as, as the kind of project evolved. I think like most people doing this kind of research, you know, it was challenging in that particularly in trust, there was this very complex and shifting relationship between trust in government and science and health services and research and how all of those things were affecting each other. So actually trying to kind of keep pace with that and understand, you know, where we were seeing gradual change, where there were these moments of truth and then what the longer term impacts of that was a real methodological challenge for us going, going through. Um, the pandemic was also hugely unpredictable. You know, we kind of thought, I think, that by last December, when we were wrapping this up, we might be somewhere towards the end of the pandemic. Here we are, we could have carried on asking these questions for, uh, for another year. And obviously we were also looking to keep people engaged for quite a long time. So we had to work quite hard to, make everything we did really engaging as well as paying them um, for their time. The main mechanism we used was weekly diaries and in kind of in many ways very similar to the kind of classic mass observation approach in that we provided directives in essence for people to respond to um, and some prompts for the things that we wanted them to think about but it wasn't you know very strongly structured and that was a lot of flexibility for people to uh, answer in the way that they wanted. Um, some people would write lots, some people would write very little, some people would choose to illustrate with photos or other content um, and others wouldn't. Um, what we found in this was in most weeks we didn't explicitly ask about trust, um, didn't focus on that every week by any means, but it comes up everywhere. You know, almost no matter what the question was, we were asking people to reflect on that week, whether it was their relationship with their neighbours, whether it was how their sense of place had changed, um, whether it was how they were feeling about their children going back to school. It, all of these, every time in these comments, the, these, this content comes up. And so that's fantastic. It means we've got a huge amount of data, but it's also a real challenge because we've got this real breadth and depth of data. 
um, that, that makes it quite hard, you know, where it hasn't been a direct prompt to pull it out and, and put it alongside the data where we have specifically asked about trust. Um, also became really apparent that we'd slightly underestimated, I guess, um, is when you've got 145 people keeping weekly diaries, uh, actually reading them, prompting, asking people to clarify things very swiftly becomes an unmanageable task unless you have a large team. Um, so we had to be quite strategic in focusing on the people who were perhaps writing less um, or were slow to respond to make sure that we were getting enough data from those people and trusting that the people who'd written lots had given us uh, what we were looking for or within that. Um, but certainly it would have been helpful if we'd been able to more actively engage with people through this, this process. Alongside a kind of classic diary, every week we ask people to complete two or three other much smaller tasks, um, which gave us different ways of kind of collecting information some ways of summarizing it quite quickly so we could see what the kind of overarching view was um, without having to read all 140 and process them in real time so that we knew where we needed to follow up in the future and kind of we could identify emerging issues that we wanted to probe a bit deeper on in future weeks. Um, so one method we used was heat maps where we could just put up the, the kind of the collage of all the different types of organizations and people who you may or, or may not trust and just literally people could put sort of ticks and crosses and, and neutral marks on each of those and give us little comments as, as to why. Um, so this, this was really helpful for giving us kind of like that quick and easy view of like where there may be some, some sort of mixed views. So actually interestingly there, for public health England, you could see was starting at this point to maybe not be as trusted as, as some of the, the others, um, obviously, um, Big negativity over Boris versus kind of very positive for Nicola and, and a bit more mixed overall in, in uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. So it, it was useful for that, but it is very top line. And so it really was only a complement um, to, to some of that other information we were, we were gathering. Um, we also uh, used other kind of simple techniques to try and make sure that we were capturing a core set of consistent information from everybody that we're able to use in analysis and kind of use to segment people and kind of categorize them based on them on their responses so uh, we use sentence completion activities for example and this was also really reassuring just in rep knowing that we did have the diversity so one of the things we did when we went out to recruit our participants was actually screen them to make sure that we had the full political spectrum and also a spectrum of people who were more at the kind of COVID denier conspiracy theories at the end through to, to the other end. So you can see here, uh, the person here who thinks it's all a joke, doesn't believe any of it, um, through to the person who's really only focusing on peer reviewed content and is taking a very academic um, approach to it. Um, but I think what you know, the word cloud here actually shows um, is that this was about last October. Um, and you can really see actually that at this point in time, just how hard it was for everybody to make sense of the science and, you know, the vaccine was starting to emerge into the news and you can see there's lots of words which are developing, evolving, complex, changing, they're all over the place. Words like clear and reliable seem to be somewhat conspicuous by their absence. And so it's very much that just that overwhelming picture of, of confusion, really, that was so dominant at, at that point in time. And I think you know, that has waxed and waned over time how confident people are feeling about their own ability to, to understand and interpret the data. And this was a particularly difficult time. And then uh, the last kind of main type of activity we used was creative tasks. Um, and we incorporated these, you know, we know that some people are just so much better expressing themselves visually or in any other way. And just kind of writing those those journal article uh, entries um <laughs> goes without saying that some people love doing this some people messages to be like you've got to be kidding i'm not doing this um we also tried really hard to to lower the barrier and i think that was really important um in doing this so uh one of my colleagues working on this project is very artistic 
she made like little time lapse demonstration videos sometimes of kind of what we were looking for people to do and often uh, the research team would put up uh, an example at the start of our efforts so the very first time we did this we put up our efforts so that people could see that someone like me can't draw to save my life um, and that doesn't matter terrible you know terrible art is absolutely fine um, and then we had people you know who were submitting somebody sent this I, I don't have an image of it somebody sent us this most incredible painting and I was blown away and then they said oh yeah I, this was the third attempt I wasn't happy with the first two and it, it was kind of you know gallery worthy so it, it, it really worked for some people um, obviously it has its limitations uh, we did ask people to provide a commentary and a narrative explaining their artwork every time again as always some people provided more detail than others so you know there's a, a reasonable level of interpretation that's going to have to happen through the analysis process um, so in this example we were asking people just kind of imagine the area where they live as a person and think about what that person is like but really also importantly think about what their relationship to it is um, so if we just zoom in on, on these two examples, you can see on the left here, we've got someone who's essentially expressing quite a lot of distrust of their community, you know, their relationship to them. They avoid them. They talk about them being selfish. And everything about this picture is kind of, as they put the top, sad and depressing, really kind of pushing back and saying, this isn't, this isn't my community. I don't feel that connection with it. On the other side, we have Lenny, again, another incredible piece of artwork uh, for, for the perspective of someone like me. Um, and here you can see that actually the narrative in some ways is similar. They describe this person as being opinionated. They talk about them as being stubborn. And actually when you read what they've written there, it's some of those kind of same selfish behaviors that it's not that everybody here is kind of obeying lockdown rules and all those things, but actually what it's conveying is still this affection for the place and the community they see the humour, they're going to still carry on talking to this person, they're definitely not avoiding them. And so it, we've got a whole series of these which really shows how people's relationships with their places and, and that the trust in the people around them kind of changed or were altered um, through, through COVID. Um, and just because we all love pictures, I think, um, another activity we ask people to do, which I think relates to something Claire was talking about, was really what, what is your place? What is your community? Where is your world? Um, and we ask people to, to draw their, their before and their, their now. Um, and so you can really see a very visual representation of the diversity of people's lives and how they really felt that they, they had contracted. Um, and this, this kind of um, space over here where on the, on the left hand side we've got, we've got the Isle of Wight um, and on the other one, just that very literal, the rest of the world, I think it perhaps speaks to perhaps what you've seen in terms of the, where you had all the, the foreign places appear in your, in your research about Edinburgh, um, that people were really pulling out through these, you know, distant family or kind of feeling really disconnected from other places. And that was a really strong theme um, that came out and kind of very visually represented that space or those lines um, marking that, that division. Overall, just in terms of, I think, you know, what we learned from, from doing this online diary approach, um, it, lots of things worked really, really well. Fortunately, we had really high levels of engagement. We only lost very few people. Some people didn't complete every activity every week, but most people stuck it through to the end and completed the majority. Um, it worked for different people with different styles. It was also really flexible. So people had a week to complete each task every time so they could do it in bits, days and times that worked for them around all their other commitments. Um, and it was also really flexible for us. So we could suddenly go, eek, something's happened. <laughs> like, let, let, let's jump on this. Um, and the, the feedback we got from participants was really, really positive about their experience. Um, Perhaps most critically, it's given us a huge and uh, very rich data set, um, which is, you know, amazing. As I said, though, it's, it, it was more hard work than we anticipated, really would have benefited from more time, just engaging with participants throughout. Um, you know, we learned as we went along that some activities were better than others and appealed to more people than others. 
Um, and there are also some, some limitations. We have to think really hard around question order and prompts in a way that actually when you're doing face-to-face, -face, well, is, is less critical. It, 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 at times it felt really difficult to know what order to put things in um, when you have slightly less control over what order people are going to answer questions in. So there were some, some issues around that. And then obviously we've got this kind of mixed methods <laughs> data set that we have to figure out what to, what to do with. Um, and I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge we now have is the amount of data. I was just going to put up a picture of me drowning in data. You know, we are several months on from finishing this and we have 6,000 data points just from the online study. That doesn't include the quant, it doesn't include the peer research. So um, actually processing the volume of data with a small team is, is, is challenging, um, if an exciting challenge to have. Um, and yeah, obviously it does exclude those without digital skills, which we tried to address through the peer research. And then I just thought I'd finish on a, on a slightly more positive note. Um, we asked people to draw for us what their post-COVID utopia was. And again, we got some really incredible um, artwork there. The one on the left, uh, we had a prize for the best one. And the one on the left was the one that all the participants voted to be kind of the best visualization, the best view of of our, our post-COVID utopia. I think we might be um, some way off this, but it, it's definitely a, a utopian uh, vision of, of what we're looking for. So I thought that would be uh, a nice positive note to end on. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's um, uh, uh, fascinating. Again, um, all sorts of things, um, uh, well, and some interesting overlaps. I'm kind of struck by both, both how have both your your papers and I think perhaps <clears throat> previous presentations as well as all the projects are kind of worried and conscious of sort of the problem of representative representativeness but then um, on, the, on the other hand everybody's describing these very kind of rich sources which generate this as you described this problem about there's just too much there's loads and loads of things so it's like at some level there's a kind of a glass half empty or a glass half full um, analysis isn't it isn't it that, that actually um, allowing for those those kind of issues of, um, of skewing, actually the types of material people seem to be engaging with are, are incredibly, uh, have all sorts of potentials. Um, so that was kind of really uh, uh, fascinating. Thank you. Again, if anybody has any immediate kind of comments or thoughts at, the, at this moment, any, any offers of help to... to <laughs> These best students. <laughs> we could do that. Um, raise a hand or shout or butt in. I think there's a question in there about place and community and environment. So, uh, yeah, we asked that because uh, the definition of community we were working with was a place based one. Um, so, actually, I mean, community is such a subjective word and such a subjective context, concept. I mean, we, we spent quite a long time with our advisory board uh, discussing what we meant by community, and um, we did sort of have to narrow it down to a uh, a primary interest of place that's what the young foundation uh focuses on but actually we didn't use the word community with participants until about week nine um because we knew that for some people community is a virtual thing or they don't believe in community or, or whatever it might be so we actually talked mostly about relationships relationships with people relationships with place relationships with institution and we only introduced that word community in the sense of a place-based community quite late on um and yeah so that was the part of it uh, and nigel if you have a question yeah yeah well thanks that was really fascinating victoria um i, I just wondered uh, the challenge of all the all the data and the different forms of data um i mean i've got that with a, a much smaller scale thing um so i do both envy and sympathize um I wondered how much you, you, what your end goal is to kind of integrate all of that, or do you see kind of different sets of data and aspects of the data addressing rather different questions and, and not necessarily feeling everything's got to kind of be brought together into one overall position? Yeah, uh, definitely. So we, during, while it was live, we started producing some snapshot reports, which were very much focused on specific 
topics and specific issues and we are now analyzing the data kind of very yeah as you said kind of focusing on different questions and different issues i think we realized quite early on that if we tried to bring all of this together it would probably actually just be overwhelming and it may well be impossible and i'm not sure that you know you wouldn't be able to see the wood for the trees um i think there's a question in there somewhere in my minds and our minds that the young foundation is you know We've spent the last two years almost looking at almost every aspect of community and and COVID, and it feels like there should be an answer somewhere. You know, what what has COVID done to communities? And actually, it's really not yeah. not, <laughs> not that simple. But you know, where where do we look to synthesize in the future? I think is a is a really key question. You know, not just our work, but you look at all the work that's been shared just in this group over over the last few months it's kind of you know how we collectively make sense of it um, um at, a, at a macro level i think is a really interesting question yeah thank you okay um thank you so much again then uh, victoria i'm sure we'll come back to some of these kind of um cross-cutting themes at, at, at the end so we're going to move on to the, the final talk uh of the afternoon which is uh from uh, patrick collier and James Con Connolly, all the way from uh, from Indiana. Um, over to you, uh, Patrick, I think, initially. Thanks very much, Clive. Um, I will share my screen. I, you can see Jim there uh, sitting in his office in a building about 0.2 miles away from where I'm sitting here in Muncie, Indiana. Uh, I'm going to take a second here and share my screen. And do this. Everybody seeing this okay? All right, so in this talk, we're gonna start by intro introducing you to our project, Everyday Life in Middletown, which is very much inspired by mass observation. Uh, it's an archival project. Then we'll share with you some of what our volunteer writers have been saying about the pandemic and float a few hypotheses about how they're depicting the ways in which the pandemic has disrupted time for them. So you're going to see uh, here some overlap and really interesting connections with Don Lyon and Becky Coleman's presentation here in July um, and also with Claire's paper today. So I think this will be good. Um, and then as we move along, we're going to emphasize what elements of people's pandemic experience might be local. Um, so again, I mean, like uh, the others today, this is a place-based project. Um, what might be local about people's pandemic experience or, or at least what might be sort of structural to a place with a similar history or similar economic dynamics uh, to Muncie, Indiana, which Jim will go into uh, in the second half of the presentation. Um, so here you see our web page, um, and at the end of the talk, I will drop our uh, our uh, uh, link into the chat box in case anybody wants to take it. Um, in a nutshell, what we do is we solicit day diaries and directives from a group of volunteer writers, and we publish them on this website. Uh, the website also contains a blog where we and sometimes others write about the archive and also write about everyday life and about local everyday life. Um, before we go into detail, it will be helpful to do some comparison to mass observation. Um, our project actually takes a lot of its inspiration from the late 30s, the origins of mass observation. Um, and so um, here are some points in over, uh, of like sort of, I think, significant overlap between the way we've conceived this project and the original mass observation. We're interested in the political valences and potentials of everyday life. Um, our project arises in part from a sense of crisis in the public sphere. And, you know, so we sort of conceived everyday life in Middletown as what we call at the time an online commons and a kind of an alternative to hostile public spaces, uh, hostile online spaces. Um, and like the original mass observation, and I think Nick Hubble actually talked about this when he gave his presentation. Um, we have a program of quick turnaround publishing, which of course is web publishing in this case. But, you know, our diaries, we collect our diaries, 90% of our materials are actually just day diaries. We collect them and we put them on the archive like, you know, two weeks later. And so this is an open access archive that's, you know, sort of immediately generated. Um, a couple differences, um, aside from the difference in scale, which is, you know, of course, perhaps the greatest difference. Um, this is a, focused on a single community, right? And so um, this, we're in Muncie, Indiana, which is the middle town of the famous Ur sociological study. 
Um, and in addition to being focused here, our, you know, our project, like the original mass observation, mass observation um, tries to build community, but tries really to build local community. And so one of the things we're kind of motivated by here is a is a an attempt to sort of re-emphasize local connections at a time when sort of delocalization is happening in larger media right where it's very common for somebody to be identified with online communities that are not geographically based and of course it's not uncommon for these online communities to be sort of like hostile or xenophobic or etc and so that's kind of where the utopian um kind of vision of this pro uh, project lies so we've been doing this since about 2016 for what it's worth um um so um i want to transition here to uh that so we've been talking about the project overall what, what we're going to do today focuses on our pandemic materials specifically um and two main issues one is how the pandemic has disrupted time and the other is what elements of this experience might be described as local Okay, and so here are our specific research questions. Um, we're interested in how our writers represent disruptions of time during the pandemic. So again, very lots of overlap with Don and Becky's uh, uh, um, presentation in July. Um, we're interested in the different time frames that are involved, and we'll have some examples later on. But just to concretize that a little bit, we've definitely noted that on the one hand there are disruptions of how everyday time passes, right? And so people feel like you know just the passage of time in the day seems strange, um, but also the ways in which the future is involved in that, and the you know the degrees to which you know the sort of narrowing or the muddying of the future has sort of um, impacted. Uh, people in various ways. Um, of course, we also want to foreground local elements, right? So we're interested in how pandemic disruptions of time influence people's sense of belonging or non-belonging. Um, and finally, we, uh, we want to um, engage in this kind of local cultural script of a community in decline. This came up in Claire's paper about Flint before um, and how people's life writing, people writing back to people, people writing their everyday life at this moment during the pandemic um, are also sort of orienting themselves or not towards this local narrative of decline. This is our actual data set. Um, and so again, you'll see the difference of scale here. We have 350 artifacts total over this sort of five-year project. It, it amounts to about 400,000 words, so about the size of a nice chunky Russian novel. Um, uh, the, for this particular paper that we're limbing today, um, we have uh, two directives, uh, one on attitudes towards Muncie, one on the pandemic and time. Um, and so about 34 artifacts there. And then all of the diaries that were submitted during the pandemic, that's 46 objects. And then a longitudinal reading of four writers over four plus years, which that also adds up to about 46 objects. Jim is gonna be talking about two of these uh, writers uh, in his part of the, in his part of the uh, presentation. So uh, moving on to some tropes and patterns that we noticed in people's writing about the pandemic. Um, first of all, and you, this will come as no surprise to anyone, uh, during in the passage of every every day time, the experience of time durations being confused. And so I'll give you a moment to read these. So you will notice here something that we see, I've, you know, uh, uh, a trope that I've seen in a lot of the diaries that have been uh, and artifacts that have pre been presented across these seminars, and also the sort of gallows humor, right, that um, seems to mark a lot of this writing. Um, a number of our writers also provided some insight or some of their thoughts into what was disrupting the flow of everyday time. And that's what you see on this next slide here. Uh, people talking really about how disruptions in spatial mobility or, um, yeah, how, you know, basically how time and space are interlocked and how disruptions in spatial mobility influence their experience of time. So again, I'll give you a second to read a couple quotes here. So a couple instances here of the way people are recognizing that time and space are playing um, are playing 
conjoined roles in messing up uh, the flow of everyday time. Um, so those last two slides really pertain to to what you know what uh, Ben Heimer actually calls everyday time elsewhere. Um, but I want to move on to how the pandemic uh, seems to be influencing people's concepts of longer time frames. And there are really two uh, elements here. Um, one is the elimination of the midterm and long-term future, the way in which um, midterm planning is basically impossible and long-term planning seems really difficult. Um, and second, the, the autobiographical life writing elements of this, right? So, and this is another thing that's come across the seminars. If we can look at the everyday life in Middletown diaries and directives as, as forms of life writing, um, when the future gets disrupted, one of the questions we wanna ask is how this, how this influences the autobiographical self that gets reflected in these diaries. Um, so, you know, if, uh, if, a, if life writing typically assumes a writer with agency who's seeing links to the past in what's happening today, it is also seeing a shaping of the future happening today. How does the pandemic kind of mess that up? Um, um, the third element and the one that really pushes us towards the local here uh, is the way in which people's life narratives as we're, as we're discovering take place in relation to this larger local story about industrial decline and tenuous renewal. And Jim will be talking about this in greater detail in a little bit. Um, and so we wanted to ask the question about like, what, how does this, how does, how does the, the over the uber narrative, the local narrative influence people's sense of belonging and how is the pandemic um, and playing a role as a new dynamic in that. Um, so we're sort of hypothesizing here that we're getting a glimpse of a localized structure of feeling. Um, and uh, there were two theoretical models that sort of came up as we're thinking this through. Um, one is Lauren Berlant's work and uh, Don and Becky referenced um, cruel optimism in their talk in July. Um, they had referenced the impasse, which is one of Berlant's ideas, but, you know, so Berlant has this notion of social genres, like the idea that everyday life itself has genres and conventions. Um, and of course, cruel optimism is very much about the way that late capitalism is disrupting those genres and conventions and that new ones are taking form. And so she actually uh, references this, what she calls, quote, the situation. Uh, which is uh, here the quote, a genre of social time in which a relation of persons and worlds is sensed to be changing, but the rules for habitation and the genres of storytelling about it are unstable. So we're, you know, we're looking at these diaries, these, the, the life writing that takes place in these diaries, as, especially during the pandemic, as contending with this, this, this space in which even the conventions of life writing itself are sort of disrupted. The second theoretical model, I'm sorry, theoretical model comes from Ben Highmore, who's here with us today, um, particularly Ben's re-articulation of Raymond Williams's notion of the structure of feeling. So in Cultural Feelings, Ben um, kind of recasts the structure of feeling as a living triangulation between an individual's biography, uh, his or her contemporary social position, and the larger national and geopolitical forces at work. Um, and so we, we really like this model because it doesn't sort of um, envision the structure of feeling as, as a feeling that's kind of widely available or even a small set of feelings, but rather as a larger structure within which feeling happens, right? So these are the kind of theoretical models that were, were um, invoked for us by the work that we've been looking at and that we're trying to bring to, this, um, to this, these materials. So we got interested in probing further how this local narrative of industrial decline uh, was influencing how people's autobiographical narratives play out and how the pandemic was influencing them. Um, and so, um, you know, what we have a sense is that, is that, um, you know, the industrial decline has already been reshaping the way people see themselves and that it's, it's sort of kind of impossible for somebody who lives in Muncie, Indiana, not to position themselves relative to that larger narrative. And then the question we wanted to look at here is how does the pandemic sort of complicate that even further. Um, and so um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim now who will talk a little bit about 
Muncie as Middletown and then uh, talk through two, what we've seen in two of our volunteer writers around these questions. Okay, thanks, Pat. Uh, uh, you've heard that we're gonna talk about a couple of people, not quite yet. Um, Pat's gonna work the slides for me. Um, but before we talk about the people, the two diarists that, that uh, we're interested in today, I wanted to just introduce you to Muncie a little bit more. Um, there's two things to know about it. The first of which is that it's a Rust Belt city, much like Flint, Michigan, it's been referenced already today. It's a place that once was the, uh, the site of many factories, industrial production, most of that has, has gone away. It's been replaced by uh, an eds and meds model. The two major employers in town are a university and a, a medical complex based in a, a local hospital. Uh, one of the byproducts of the city's industrial history is its enduring divisions, uh, social uh, class divisions, uh, as well as racial divisions. There's still a very clear social geography to the city that's been around for the better part of a century. What's happened as the economy has changed is that uh, a set of town gown tensions have sort of overlaid these existing divisions um, and they've really accentuated uh, the importance of education as a, a source of difference uh, in the city. The second thing to know, which Pat has already mentioned, is that Muncie is Middletown. It was the subject of the Lynn's original community study back in the 1920s, uh, which in turn spawned many follow-up studies that have continued down to the present day. What this work has done is really establish uh, a reputation for Muncie as an emblematic American community. I don't want to say typical, but it's represented as a, a, a sort of classic American community. One of the arguments through much of this work is that the city is constantly experiencing a cultural lag. It's behind the times. It hasn't adjusted to new economic and technological realities. And all of this has produced a portrait of the place as the quintessential provincial town. And so what we're interested in doing is looking at the way in which this narrative of the locale figures in the life writing uh, in the material that we're collecting. Uh, we're collecting. And it, uh, our, our diarists use it as a device to frame both the present and the future in what we think are some interesting ways. Go ahead, Pat. Um, so we're going to introduce you to two diarists. Uh, both of them are um, men, most middle-aged men. Uh, both of them are educated. Uh, they're not chosen because they're particularly representative of our set of contributions, nor are they representative of the community more generally. But what they are is a couple of rich illustrations of uh, the ways in which a place-based narrative uh, intersects with life telling. The first of these is A23. Uh, he is in his early 40s, uh, went to graduate school, moved to Muncie from the South, partly for professional reasons. Also, his mother-in-law was here. Um, and what we see in his writing before the pandemic is, is really a feedback loop where he critiques the town in, in a very um, negative light, um, and his critique reinforces his plans to, to go somewhere else, um, and he sees his future as located somewhere else. He likes to write about his forever town, and he's constantly discussing his Muncie escape strategy, something he says everybody needs to have. Um, and much of his writing is describing how he is trying to save up money to have a down payment for a house. And the one thing he knows is that that house will not be in Muncie. When we asked him to talk about the city, uh, he described it as fractured, bitter, exhausted. It was a pretty harsh portrait. In one part of the passage, he talks about how he sees Muncie as, as burning down and still burning down. Um, and, and what's striking is the way in which he doesn't see himself as having a dog in this fight, that this is something he's observing from the outside. He really cultivates this sense of distance from the community, and he creates this dynamic where his portrait of the community in decline validates his plans to, to go elsewhere. He writes about how Muncie is just a staging area for him, a practice round. And then as we move to the next slide, and uh, we look at the changes that take place in his writing when the, the pandemic arrives, you see a really uh, a sharp decline in discussions of his personal future. The, there really isn't much of, anymore about the forever town. And he's not talking so much about the city in, in general. There's not a lot of discussion about how he doesn't feel like he fits in, that he doesn't belong uh, in this place. He's, he welcomes the quarantine. Uh, he sees it as a break, a, a kind of sabbatical. Uh, he thinks it's going to last two or three weeks uh, at, at first and is 
uh, a little surprised later on to discover how long it's lasted. Uh, uh, one of the big events that occurs during the, the pandemic experience for him is the death of his mother-in-law. And this occupies a lot of his attention, a lot of his writing through the pandemic period. Uh, what's also interesting is that as the end of lockdown approaches, as the end of the time when he can work from home approaches and he's gonna have to return to the office, uh, it really, you see a renewal of his expressions of being an outsider in the community. Um, he's very critical of the community. He sees his employer as one of the few in town that really takes mask mandates seriously, talks about the nasty patrons that he's encountering uh, on a regular basis. We asked our diarist to also talk about the uh, influence of the pandemic on, on their sense of time. And part of A23's response is a description of his last weekend before he has to go back to full-time face-to-face work. And he talks about his plan is to use that time wisely, don't waste it, fill it with goodness. Uh, he talks about how grateful he is for the people he knows here and how much he loves them. And there's a real interesting contrast between his description of the people that he encounters in his lockdown life and the people he's encountering in his non-lockdown life in public, the nasty patrons versus the people he knows and loves uh, in this community. And what we, we kind of see is um, that as his engagement with the community ramps up, so does his sense of urgency about getting out of town, moving on to this, this um, longer life plan of settling down personally and professionally in another place. And uh, uh, on the other side of the coin, He's talk, he talk, when he's not engaging with the community, he's not talking about all of the problems uh, of the place, and there's a diminished sense of urgency about his future and his plans for the future. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, so now let me introduce you to a second diarist, D50. Uh, he presents himself as the trailing spouse for uh, his wife who's taken a job as an administrator in the university. He's a graduate of a culinary school uh, but for health reasons, he's essentially retired, except for some volunteer work uh, that he does. He's probably our wittiest diarist. Um, he has this very acerbic, um, playful tone, um, and he really emphasizes how he sees himself as an outsider uh, in this community. And it's important to note that he sees himself as at a different point in his life compared to A23. He's retired um, for, for these health reasons. Um, and so he's not as future focused as A23 is. Instead, he, he writes a lot about uh, the, his place or his relationship to this community, uh, which he sees himself as pretty distant from, as standing outside of and observing. Um, his, his writing is very ideological. He writes from a left-wing perspective. Uh, he has a, a clever device where he uses footnotes uh, to write these very witty asides addressing readers in a future socialist paradise. They're quite funny in, in, in many cases. He also adopts this, this kind of mock capitalist framing where he contrasts uh, the locals and their behaviors with uh, the behavior of people who live in North American coastal regions. Uh, He's very critical of, of capitalism. He sees Muncie as really uh, an example of the failures of capitalism, the decline uh, of the United States uh, more, more generally. Um, when we asked him about Muncie, he has an equally negative view of the place. He talks about not wanting to live in the city. He talks about how much he's repelled by it, how despondent and desolate it feels. Uh, he came from another community that was experiencing a post-industrial reinvention that felt invigorating, but Muncie just seems dead uh, to him. Uh, and you see in the, the second to last bullet point, the way he describes locals. This is a kind of a tongue in cheek passage, but it, it captures some of the tone of, of his writing. He talks about mean spirited dullards, mouth breathers, half wits and so forth down to methamphetamine tweakers. So uh, there's a really sharp tongue aspect to what he produces. And what he concludes of himself is that he's a dual citizen, um, observing as an outsider, getting, but getting involved in a few things here and there. And this is overlaid with this sense of doom, the sense of decline that he's observing. Now, when the pandemic hits, um, that a sense of distance, that sense of observing decline really gets intensified. Uh, uh, there's a couple things that happened to him in the course of the pandemic period. The first of which is he gets quite sick. Uh, he's not officially diagnosed with COVID, but it appears that that's what it was. He ends up in the hospital and ultimately the ICU has a very slow recovery. He also spends a lot of time talking about his fear and disgust regarding the political situation in the country, both the racial conflicts of 2020 
and the the presidential election campaign and then outcome. Uh, he acknowledges, uh, like A23, that he's not really engaging with the community. He's not going out. And so he doesn't have much to say about what's going on in the community at this moment. Um, and on, but unlike on A23, he really is not worried about a future that's elsewhere. He doesn't have a career track uh, in front of him. And so he's really heavily focused on the immediate moment, the now. Uh, and he italicizes the word now repeatedly in his writing. You see it in the, the, the passage here where he talks about the, uh, the US being collectively like a child who doesn't understand that the time of reckoning is at hand here now. Uh, and then he has this great image of observing what's going on locally and nationally as if it were uh, observed. He was observing a Doppler radar image of a storm approaching. Uh, there's this, this sense of foreboding, this sense of doom that, uh, uh, that he sees because he's positioning himself both outside and above the community. Uh, and for him, this is what the now feels like. When he does talk about what's going on locally, he uses it as kind of uh, a sampling of national trends related to the lockdown, the panic buying, the empty streets, mask shortages, and so forth. And here again, he stresses the, the, the now, the immediate. This is the novel coronavirus pandemic declared March 11th, 2020. This is America. Uh, this is where we are. So the big point we're trying to get at here in both of these uh, examples uh, is that the life writing they produce would turn out differently if they were engaging with uh, the narrative of, of a different kind of community, if they were located in a metropolitan center, if they were located in a prosperous suburb, uh, a pleasant small town, uh, the writing that they produce would necessarily be different. Um, uh, A23's narrative of his pursuit of his, his future home would not be uh, uh, as intense uh, in all likelihood, um, and D50 wouldn't have this fodder for his emphasis on the now, uh, an emphasis that gets ratcheted up by the pandemic. So um, I think we'll leave it there uh, so we can give everyone plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. Thanks.